Revelation chapter 3 verse, 7, uh, verse 14 And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness The beginning of the creation of God I know thy works and By the way friends he does know He's keeping a record He said I know thy works That thou art neither cold nor hot I would thou wert cold or hot so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Let's pray. Father we bless you. Lord we thank you for people that were given to God. That you could give them words to songs like we've heard from the choir. and From the little group we put together. Lord we're thankful that. The words of those songs can be reality in our lives when we submit our lives to Thee. God, I'm glad that, Lord, You don't just bring us to a storm, You bring us through the storm. It's going to pass over one of these days. I'm glad, Lord, that uh, it can be well with our soul and that our name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, Father, I pray that You'd help us this morning as we dawn a new year. God, You'd give us uh, new desires for thee and see great revival and see a great move of God in these days Lord I do pray for our country I pray for our president and our leaders I pray they just do right I pray that righteousness would reign in America again and Lord I pray that the falseness and fraud would be revealed in our lifetime and that folks would be held accountable Lord, we know if that doesn't come to pass, you will hold them accountable. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd arrange the atmosphere around here to where folks would find help, find strength, find encouragement, find rejoicing in their soul, find refreshment, or they'd leave out excited about the goodness of God. Now, Father, help us to set in heavenly places, use this unworthy vessel, and glorify your name. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I, I want you to notice some things about this Laodicean church. I never like preaching on these churches in Revelations 2 and 3 without reminding you these were seven literal churches. <coughs> uh, some years back, they, folks started spiritualizing the churches as ages. Now, each of these churches do represent certain ages. The Laodicean church represents the age we live in right now. But there was a literal church of Laodicea that the Lord sent this message to. But just like anything God does, uh, it transcends even into our day. Now, I want you to notice a few things about the Laodicean church. I want you to notice its mediocrity. Look at verse number 15 again. The Lord says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The Lord said, you're just lukewarm. You're not cold, you're not hot, you're just there. He said, I would, you was either cold or hot. If you're hot, you're on fire for God. If you're cold, you know you're cold, you know you need to get on fire for God. But there's a danger of being in that lukewarm state. Can I say, in their mediocrity, they'd become rehearsed. Routine. They just went through the motions. Can I say that in pastoring now, going on my, on my third decade, and in preaching now, in well in my third decade, and being a Christian now in my fifth decade... Can I say something that I never thought I'd see, but I'm seeing it, that folks come to church 
just as a routine. Last year would have been a great opportunity with all that befell this country for the church to stand up and make America different. But Christians just are in a rut. We're just come to church, go home, come back to church, live life, come to church, live life. We just do what we're expected to do. We come to church, but we don't have church. Some of you got a little nervous when I pulled up some people you never heard singing like that before. Well, they're sitting in the program, bless God. Thad, put it in the bulletin. Preacher's going to call up folks to sing. Huh? See, we like routine. We know what to expect from routine. We go the way we go to work because we know the traffic routes. And, and, and we just we watch the same newscast because we get familiar with those people. And uh, uh, we eat at the same restaurants or order the same thing we ate at the last time we ate because we like it. And it's routine. And we just, we're routine people. But you see, in the realm of God, routine's not a good place to be. We see their mediocrity, they'd become rehearsed. Most churches, you can tell within three men who, God's going, or who the, man's going to, the pastor's going to call on to pray, and you know what they're already going to pray because you've heard them pray 37 times before, and they always pray the same thing. You know you're going to come in, they're going to... Sing a couple of songs, going to get some announcements, uh, going to take up an offering, you're going to have some preaching, you're going to go home. I mean, you know, you know the routine. But nowhere in serving God do we find that we're to be bland and routine, rehearsed. And I tell you, the Bible says the mercies of God are renewed every day. That means every day is an adventure with God. And every time we come to worship, it ought to be something exciting. Can I say that in their mediocrity, they'd become reclusive. They were isolated. Can I tell you the problem most churches in America? The worship, the knowledge they learned from the Bible, the songs they learned to sing... Even the excitement in their services stays in the church house. We are not impacting the world. Yet the Lord told us to go and preach the gospel to every creature. Nowhere in the scriptures did God say, build you a temple and come in and sit down and keep it there. But we become reclusive. Church was mediocre. It was rehearsed. It was reclusive. But in their mediocrity, they'd become repulsive. The Lord said, I will spew thee out of my mouth. In other words, the sight of their lukewarmness made the Lord of all glory regurgitate. You know what is repulsive? Is that it doesn't sicken us. We ought to be sick of the normal church. We ought to want something that is supernatural. Because if you read the book of Acts, that church was supernatural. And can I help you with something? God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Same God they worshipped is the same God we're supposed to be worshipping. What's the difference? The attitude of the people. I want you to see in the layout of seeing churches mediocrity. I want you to notice their mindset. See, you understand something about their actions when you find out what they're thinking. Notice their mindset. Can I say, first of all, they'd become comfortable. Look at verse 17. He said, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and here it is, and have need of nothing. Can I say that most Christians in America anyway have become comfortable. You know you can come to church and there's no threat to you or your family if you come to church. You know that as long as uh, you pray and read your Bible, pay your tithes, that you, you'll be checked off in the Baptist faith that you, you're a good Christian and you're comfortable with that. And we've just gotten comfortable. 
it just might be that the Lord may allow Biden to get in office so we start praying again. I'm talking about grabbing the horns of the altar praying. Just might happen, might be that God allows Biden to get in office so the church can suffer some persecution again. You know, throughout the Bible, whenever God's people were persecuted, they grew. Hmm? We've gotten comfortable. Can I say something else? They'd become complacent. Look what else he said in verse 17. He says, They said they'd had need of nothing. He said, And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You see, verse 17 is their self-diagnosis. They think they're doing okay. Brother Brian, they say, bless God, we come to church. We don't drink no more. We don't cuss anymore. We don't crowd around anymore. We come to church. Uh, 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 we're there. We go out on visitation. We pray. Uh, we come to revival meeting. We sing in the choir. We're doing pretty good. And that's their mindset. And that's many Christians' mindset. Can I say Christianity is not based on our doing. Christianity is based on what's in our heart. And we've got the mindset we're doing okay, but... What does God see in our heart? Are we doing it because it's expected of us? Or are we doing it because of what He done for us? This is a big difference. They'd also become compromised. Look at verse 17 again. He said, Knowest not that thou art poor, or thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Naked shows that they don't have any fruit. They don't have anything that causes God to be pleased. Sunday school class, we was reading a bunch of names in Ezra. David's name means beloved. It means dear. David was a man after God's own heart, but more than that, David was dear to God. And I told the Sunday school class, you know what? God is dear to us. In God we have salvation. In God we have all the blessings. He gives us our breath. He gives us our strength. He gives us everything from His hand. Where you live came from God. What you're wearing came from God. What you drove in came from God. Everything. We depend on God. He's dear to us. But are we dear to God? When God looks across the face of America, He looks across uh, people that have been blood washed, people that are going to heaven, people's names that are in the Lamb's Book of Life, He says, yeah, they're saved. But are they dear to Him? Is your life so precious to God that He just comes and sits down and fellowships with you? You see, they were compromised. We see their mediocrity. We see their mindset. But notice what is mandated I told you their self diagnosis now we're going to see the Savior's diagnosis In verse 18 he says I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salves that thou mayest see now, the Lord counsels them to buy something of Him. Now, that's an odd term. I mean, if I want to go buy something at Kroger's, I'll go buy something, get in Miss uh, Caitlin's line, and, and you know, you know pay, pay for it there, and, and hope she's got some coupon stuff to weigh or something. But anyway, I'll go, I'll get what I want, and I give the money, and then I take it home. That's me buying it. That's something that I desire. Something that I go and I purchase, I pay with it my, with my own earned money, and I take it home with me. That's how we buy stuff. But how do you buy something from God? He don't take American Express. Hmm? Uh, he don't take any bills that doesn't have his picture on it. 
and you don't have any of them in your wallet. Hmm? You don't take George Washington's and Benjamin Franklin's and all. No. How do you buy something from God? Well, the only way for one to buy or accumulate spiritual things from God begins with contrition. God is nigh them of a broken heart and save us such of a contrite spirit. When you get broken before God, you're starting to get God's attention. You're starting to, you're starting to earn some credit with God. It begins with contrition, then there's confession. When you admit to God that you're not all that you profess you are. When you admit to God that you are increased with goods because He's blessed you, but inside you're empty. You do have needs. You have need of His touch. You have need of His fellowship. You confess to God that you've not been right and you want to get right. It takes contrition. It takes confession. Then it takes consecration. Where you turn from whatever it is that held you back and you turn to Him and you let God do a work in your heart and life and change you and transform you. That's how you buy something from God. You get God's attention by you getting low and making much of Him. Hmm? Well, what are we to buy from Him? Well, we're to buy righteousness that's been tempered. Look what he said. He said, gold tried in the fire. Gold's always a picture of righteousness. He said, gold that's been tempered, that's been tried. Gold that'll work. Gold that'll stand the test of time. Righteousness that is not your filthy rag righteousness. Uh, His righteousness. Uh, His righteousness which overcame the world, the devil, and the flesh. Uh, His righteousness is what you need. You also can buy from God raiment that is telling. Not only a righteousness that's been tempered, but raiment that has been telling. Uh, he said, in white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. That white raiment shows holiness, right standing with God. And when you live right, people know it. It tells on you. Hmm? Hmm? When you come in ready to worship, nobody has to ask you if you're ready to worship. It shows on you. Hmm? But then he also directs us to use the remedy of truth. He said to buy the gold tried in the fire, buy the white raiment, but notice what he says, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. He's saying use the remedy of the truth. What will open your eyes that you may see? The truth of God's word. The Bible makes it clear that the Bible is a looking glass. We look into God, uh, uh, God's word, and it reveals unto us our shortcomings. You see, when I look at you, I can find your shortcomings. You know, I have a real easy way to do that. Uh, I just don't like to look at me, see my own shortcomings. But see, when I get in the Bible, I have a real far, hard time finding you because all I see is me right. and where I fall short of the glory of God. Huh? Well, listen, I got to thinking about this church of Laodicea, and, and it resembles many Christians of our day and age. It resembles what Christianity has become, anemic, not life-changing. Why do you think they build these great Ephesus and now they buy hardware stores and turn them into churches and shopping malls and turn them into churches and they pack those places in with people because there's an air of excitement. They got rock bands and smoke on the stage and they got stuff that makes people feel good. And why do people flock to that? It's an escape. They can get their minds off their miserable life and then go somewhere where it's exciting for a minute. You can go to a rock concert and be excited for a minute. But it's not life-changing. That's why the vineyard hadn't even opened up after COVID. They don't have nothing worth sustaining people for. That's what church has become. Just something for people to get an escape for a little while, get their mind off what's going on in the world, get their mind off their problems in their life, come to, come to some place where it might be exciting for a minute. But by the time you put your keys in your car or push that uh, uh, push button start in your car, all the world, all your problems comes weighing back in on you. And that's what most Christianity is. That's why the world don't flock to the church. They don't see anything worth having. They look at you when you leave and you look as miserable as you did when you came in. 
Who wants misery? We need help. This is what I want to preach on. I want to preach on this thought. Being a church of relevance. I want to be relevant this year. I want the politicians not to say they're non-essential. I want the politicians to say everybody needs to go over there. They got something we need, and it's better than a vaccine. Uh, this will not only help you now, but it'll help you for all of eternity. Uh, I want to be a church uh, that is relevant, uh, a church that is life-changing, uh, a church that people see a difference, uh, a church where you come in burdened down, but you leave out rejoicing because uh, you touch the hem of the Master's garments. Uh, I want to be a church uh, where God shows up uh, and the whole community knows God's in His house. Uh, I don't want to be a relevant church. I don't want to be that Laodicean church. I don't want to be a dead church. I don't want to be a compromised church. I don't want to be a complacent church. I want to be a church that's alive, that's thriving, that is making an impact in this oh so dark and dulcome world. I want to be a relevant church. And I want to preach with God's help on being a relevant church. Being a church of relevance. Can I say a relevant church first of all? has people who are engaged. People who are engaged. One of their problems is they isolate, they were reclusive, they isolated themselves. We need to be engaged. You can look to your right, you can look to your left, you can look in front of you, you can look behind you. You know what you're not going to find? You're not going to find perfect people. You're not going to find people with halos. Uh, you're not going to find people uh, that have no problems. What you're going to find uh, is people that have had burdens, uh, people that have struggles, uh, people that have faced hardships, uh, people that have heartaches, uh, people that have scars, uh, people that have problems. Uh, uh, but what you'll find uh, is some of those people have found the answer. Uh, there is a balm of Gilead. Uh, there is a blood that flows. Uh, there is hope in the Savior. Uh, they have found the secret. Uh, and the secret is Jesus. They have found that. Uh, what can I say? We come as an assembly. We should be engaged with one another. But when we leave and disconnect as an assembly, we ought to be engaged uh, and let people know in our jobs, uh, in our neighborhoods, uh, at our schools, uh, across the street or down the road, uh, there is hope for them. Uh, most Christians, when they leave the house of God, they leave God here. You know what the world needs? Jesus. You know who has Jesus? You, if you're saved. If we're going to be relevant, we've got to be engaged. If you don't get involved, you have no right to complain. If you have children going to public school, you ought to be involved in the public school. You ought to be on the PTA. You ought to know the principal. You ought to know the teacher. You ought to show up when they have events. You ought to be there and uh, voice your opinion. Uh, number one, uh, teachers and principals aren't used to people wanting to be involved. They're used to people dropping off their kids and running for a couple hours. Uh, uh, but if you get involved uh, and you show them you care, uh, and when you find out there's a need for the school and you get involved and you help in that need, uh, you become engaged. Guess what? You earn their confidence. Mm -mm. On the job, you ought to be involved. You ought to do more than just hit a time clock. You ought to be involved. Uh, 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 you ought to be involved in your company. You ought to know who the owner is. Uh, you ought to know who your boss is. Uh, you ought to know what your boss's uh, likes and dislikes are. Uh, uh, you ought to, if you work with people, uh, uh, you ought to be engaged with people. You ought to represent your company. Uh, you ought to let them know you care. Uh, you ought to let them know it's more than just a job. Uh, it's a place that you're investing your life in. Uh, and they ought to have confidence in you that you're more than just somebody taking a paycheck. Hmm? You ought to be engaged. Huh? At the church house, you need to be engaged. You ought to be more than just a knot on the log. If you're saved by good, the good grace of God, and if you're in the family of God, you have a right, and you have a, a position with God, and you ought to come and invest yourself in other people's lives. The greatest thing that will ever be said of you is that Jesus used you to help somebody else. Hmm? People that are engaged take part. 
they take part. They're there. Can I say this? People that are engaged, uh, they take it personal. You see, this is not just the Emmanuel Baptist Church to me. This is my church. This is where I go to church. This is my crowd right here. Huh? You may not like our crowd, but you better not talk about our crowd in front of me because this is my crowd. Uh, these are folks that prayed for me when I was sick. Uh, these are folks that have been there for me. Uh, these are folks that care about me. Uh, hey, you ought to be present and take part. Uh, that ought to mean something to you. You ought to take it personal. I take it personal. This is our church. Huh? I take it personal. Our church is always clean. I've been in churches that look like pigsties. Huh? It's hard to believe this building's uh, going on its 17th year. Look how nice it looks. People take pride in that. I take that personal. This is my church. Huh? I take it personal. I get mad when people turn around the driveway. Hey, it's our driveway. It's where we worship God. Don't turn around here. Turn around somewhere else. This is our church. I take it personal when people uh, 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 in the neighborhood uh, want to use our facilities without permission. Well, first of all, they're not going to get permission because this is God's facility. It's not some playground for, for the community. I take it personal. Why? It's my church. This is where we worship God. This is where we honor Jesus. I take it personal. I'll just take it personal. If you're engaged, you take part. You take it personal. You take pride in it. I take pride in our church. I never go, you know, I go all, I'm getting ready to go to Florida and preach. You know, I go all over the country. I never go, well, I'm a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church. I tell them who I am, and I'm the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Florence, Kentucky. There are people all over this country know about our church. There have been places where I've stood and told who I was, and people come to me and say, I've heard about your church. I take pride in our church. Hmm. Hey, we're not perfect. One day we will be. Hmm. Hey, we we still got some some bumps and bruises to take care of, but that's okay. I still this is our place. You ought to be engaged. That'll be more than just a church or the church. It'll be your church. You ought to be engaged. Hmm. I thought about it. If we're going to be a relevant church, the the people have to be engaged. And I say this, the people must exalt Jesus. If we're going to make any impact at all in this world, we've got to take to heart what Jesus said. He said, I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. It's all about Him. We've got to exalt Him. We've got to exalt Him for His glory. He's worthy to be praised. We need to exalt Him for His grace. I mean, uh, the unmerited favor of God. You didn't earn uh, uh, the privilege of sitting on that church pew. Uh, you didn't earn the privilege of singing in the choir. Uh, you didn't earn the privilege to say you're a Christian. Uh, Jesus did that for you. Uh, and through His grace, you, you, we ought to exalt Him for that. I am, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Hmm? We ought to exalt Him for His grace, for His glory, but we ought to exalt Him for His goodness. Hey, he deserves to be exalted for his glory. And we're without excuse not to exalt him for his grace, but even beyond that, he's good. How good has God been to you? He's been good to me. Huh? Hallelujah. Face COVID and still standing. Face cancer and still standing. Huh? Face angry Christians and still standing. What a blessing. Huh? God's been good. I mean, he's been good. Uh, I mean, I'm a nobody. But God's been good. Uh, he's blessed me with everything I've got. He's been, he's been good to me. You ought to exalt him. If you're going to be relevant, you have to exalt him. There's a lot of things that the charismatics do wrong. A lot of things biblically, they're not even close. But one thing they do right, they praise Jesus. And he's honored to bless them that bless that praise him. He inhabits the praise of his people. And if we just learn to praise him a little bit more, exalt him a little bit more, there's no telling how much more he'd do. You're going to be relevant. You've got to be engaged. You've got to exalt Jesus. But a relevant church has people who edify. You know, I say it's easy to tear down. It takes somebody right with God to build up. You don't have to go very far to find somebody that needs some help. You ought to edify the bruised. There are people who get bruised. 
People get bruised on the job for being a Christian. People get bruised in their own family for making a stand for the Bible. People get bruised just trying to be good and do right. Huh? You'd be driving down the road and somebody will tell you number number one, but not with that finger. I mean, you, you just, that, that'll mess you up. You can get bruised. You can get bruised on your way to church trying to figure out that stupid roundabout out there, huh? When people come to church, there's some people who've been bruised. And can I say something about a bruise? You don't really notice it till you touch it. And then you're reminded you got a bruise, sore. Now, if you're clumsy, you, you think, where'd I get that? A lot of times you remember exactly where you got that. And sometimes it just takes a little something to remind you of the bruise. And you bring that to the house of God. Well, somebody here today might be bruised. That's why you've got to be real sensitive. God might want you to just be good to somebody. Just go up and say a kind word. It might help them with their bruise. It's called edifying. We're to edify the bruise. Can I say this? We're to edify the broken. It's one thing to be bruised, it's another thing to be broken. There are people that come into the house of God with a smile, but they have wayward children, their heart's broken. There's people that come in, they've got loved ones they've been trying to witness to, and their loved ones won't listen to them. They come in broken hearted, they want to see their loved ones saved. There's people that come in, they're broken hearted because they've lost their job, or their spouse has walked out on them, or any other number of reasons they come in broken Can I help you something bruised and broken people don't need beat on they need loved on they need encouraged they need somebody to befriend them to help them and you might be the very one God wants to use to help somebody to edify somebody huh I mentioned him many times and old Frank Stinson's on that banner back there because he was an edifier yes. hmm? yes. he didn't have a lot of abilities and talents but he had a heart for God and he just wanted to help somebody and I say that'll make you a relevant Christian that'll make us a relevant church if we're known for that church that edifies people that church that has arms wide open for the broken hmm? let me help you something God specializes on, in fixing broken things. And I say we're also to edify the burdened. There's some people got heavy burdens. Maybe different for everybody. Somebody may be burdened because the doctor gave them bad news. Somebody may be burdened because they know if somebody doesn't get saved, they're going to die and go to hell. Somebody might be financially burdened. It don't matter what burdens them. What matters is getting them to the Lord. Amen. A relevant church has people who edify. What about this? A relevant church has people who are excited. Amen. Who wouldn't want a church full of Dr. Phil's? Hmm? He'll come in Wednesday night. He said, I'm glad to be here. It's Wednesday night. I've been waiting for this since Sunday. Excited. Hmm? I know some of you think he's kooky. Sit down and talk to him. He's he's pretty he's pretty on the ball. A lot more than I thought. He is a doctor. <clears throat> you've never lived till you've played catchphrase with Dr. Phil. He's got to get you to say a phrase on this little thing, and the whole time he's reading it, he's saying it out loud. How do I do this? How do I do this? How do I do this? Huh? He's funny. He's funny. But he's smart, man. He knew what a dojo was. Blew me away. Dr. Phil knew what a dojo was. Josh Vining didn't, but Dr. Phil did, huh? Got to be excited. Got to be excited about worship. Yes. You know, worship is a privilege. Amen. And worship is a verb. Yes. Right. Means you gotta, it's an action word. Means you've got to take part in it. When was the last time you was excited you got to come and worship Jesus in his house with his people? 
Say, so preacher, I can worship in my car. You can. But there's nothing like worshiping in his house. You ought to be excited about that. You ought to be excited about the word of God. I appreciate all the folks that have been so kind with their comments on the study we've been doing on Baptist distinctives and folks are saying they're getting some help and folks are excited about the next lesson and all that kind of stuff. That, that's the way it ought to always be. Anytime somebody says, take your Bible and turn, you ought to be excited because you're going to hear something from God's Word. You know what a privilege it is to have it? You ought to be excited about it. <clears throat> hmm? wish I remembered that quote I sent to Brother Greg. I'll, I'll look it up and give it to you tonight. But you can't be excited about the Word of God on Sunday if you're not excited about it on Monday. Hmm? What can I say about this? You ought to be excited for what's next. Hmm? You know, walking by faith, you don't always find out what's just ahead. But you ought to be excited. Hmm? You know when you're on a roller coaster and you're going up real slow? You know what happens? Excitement builds. And then you get to the top and it almost stops. And then you peek over and you think, what in the world am I doing here? Huh? You know what I'm saying? And it takes off down that hill. Well, the things of God ought to be, you ought to be excited for what's next. Sure. I mentioned what happened camp meeting. Two people got excited. Woo! I'll be excited. Huh? Some of the greatest preachers in the country are coming. You ought to be excited about that. You ought to be excited. In April, we've got Cody Zorn and Daniel Waters coming back. You ought to be excited for that. You ought to be excited for what's next. You know what might be next? The Lord might come. You ought to be excited for that. Huh? The irrelevant church has excitement. Hmm? People are happy to be there. They're looking forward to what's next. I thought about this last week. If we're going to be a relevant church, it's going to take people who are evangelistic. People who resent the gospel to sinners. Say, preacher, I'm not much at talking to people. We've got a whole boatload of tracks back there. Just take them and hand them to somebody. Just say, here, got this for you. You go through a drive-thru. And to, when you order food, because they deliver now, you know, when, when you get get your food, give them a tip, give, give them a track. Get the gospel out. Hmm? Hudson Taylor, the great missionary, got saved because he got a gospel track. Give a track out. Invite somebody to come to church. And be concerned about people dying and going to hell. If you get a burden that somebody's going to die and go to hell, you'll find a way to tell them about Jesus. The relevant church is evangelistic. They present the gospel. They take part in missions. What a blessing to support all those missionaries. How much do you pray for them? How much money extra do you give to missions? Taking a part in missions. The, the sun never sets on the ministry of Emmanuel Baptist Church. Somewhere one of our missionaries is trying to win somebody to God, preaching, and we're supporting them. And every time they win somebody to God, it's just as if you want them. You're praying for them and supporting them being evangelistic, presenting the gospel, taking part in missions, and praying for sinners. Say, preacher, I can't physically go and knock on doors, and I can't physically go to Africa, and I don't have much money. I give what I can. Preacher, I'd like to do more. The most important thing anybody can do is pray. You ought to pray for sinners to get saved. Pray for sinners to receive those tracts and read them, get saved. Pray for sinners to hear the missionary preaching. Pray for sinners that watch our live stream. Pray for sinners to get born again. You'll be a relevant church when you become evangelistic. I don't know about you, but I'm sick up to here with so-called church. It's even filtered into our Baptist churches where preachers want to entertain or pump or prime people to get to do so. I just firmly believe, Big Doug, if somebody's born again, the Spirit of God lives on in the inside of them, they'll just want to please God. Huh? God help us to just want to please God. I don't want the Lord to look at me and want to spew me out of his mouth. And can I say, there are many days I'm sure that's what he does. 
I want to please him. I want to become dear to him. And I want to be relevant. I want to be a relevant Christian. I want to be a relevant husband. I want to be a relevant father. I want to be a relevant pastor. I want to be a part of a relevant church. In 2021, don't you think it's about time we really make an impact in this world? The preacher, we're supporting missionaries. We're, we're doing what? No, we're not doing what we can. We're doing enough to get by. Huh? Truth be told, we can take on another ten missionaries and not hurt us at all. Why don't we start sacrificing and really get God's attention? Why don't we really start stepping out there on faith? Impacting this world. God help us. Because the night time's coming. But no man can work. We're going to do everything we can while we can. Because there's a lot of people who need Jesus. A lot of people confused. A lot of people afraid. You know the best thing you can do? Uh, Brother Doug, I make a stand. I don't wear a mask. Well, I got something better than that. Make a stand. Tell them about Jesus. Do something for Jesus. And no telling what he'll do. Well, I to pray. God, help us to be a relevant church. Help us not be like that church. Help us, Lord, to make a difference. Will you pray that way? Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. <clears throat> Folks are already coming and praying. God spoke to your heart. Why don't you come? you're here today and you don't know the Lord, why don't you come? We'd love to introduce you to Him. You're here today and saved, why don't you just ask the Lord, Lord, what can I do to please you? They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the scriptures. Lord, I don't want to be like that church of Laodicea. Lord, I certainly don't want to displease you. I want to be the best that I can be for you, and I fall short of that every day, so God help me. And then, Father, I pray for our church. Lord, you blessed us. we got a great church. we got great folks. Lord, I love seeing them walk in the door. Lord, I want to be relevant. I want to impact this world. God, send us some kind of revival that transforms us. And Lord, helps us to be like that church in Acts. That the world takes notice that we've been with Jesus. Now, Father, bless. Folks who flooded this altar. God, help them. Do something great for them. And then, Lord, I pray if there's somebody bruised or broken or burdened today, Lord, I pray for the balm of Gilead to help them. Lord, maybe you can just send one of your saints by their way to hug their neck. Give them a good word encouragement Lord just help us to impact this world and impact one another for your glory now, Lord we love you thank you for first loving us bless now in this invitation save that one nearest hell in Jesus name Amen if you enjoyed today's message head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons and don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast as always thanks for listening